Hello, this is Jonathan Kemmer with the American Maishan Breeders Association. Um, I've been raising pigs here at Oddbird Farm for about five years. Um, and over the years, I've just done a lot of research on the history of the breed specifically, some of their unique physiology. Um, and now I'd, I'd like to present that to people who are interested in raising Maishan pigs themselves. Um, so I'm going to be presenting this in a, a series of videos. Uh, but I'd like to start with just kind of a brief overview of, of pigs in China and how they were raised and, and how that's relevant to people who breed a traditional Chinese breed like the Meishan pig. Um, there are, I believe in 1960, they counted over 100 different breeds native to China. I believe they're still in the neighborhood of about 80 left. Um, and the research I'm presenting here, it covers the region where Meishans originate. Um, so this is definitely the style of production they would have been used in. Um, so I'll start by kind of talking about the uh, sources that I used for this. Um, three main ones, um, the history of pigs in China from curious omnivores to industrial pork. Um, really great article that came out about two years ago, um, really filled in a lot of gaps and added a lot of context and validated a lot of things I was finding because some of the other sources, as you'll see, aren't really historical. Um, so the second one is feed grain consumption by traditional pork producing households in China. It's actually an economics article that was published in 1998 um, when a lot of transformation was happening in the pork industry in China. It has some really good information on how they were raising and feeding pigs. Um, and then the last one, uh, really interestingly, is about a 370 page report on vegetable farming systems. Um, this is made after they took a, a delegation to China in the late 70s. Um, a lot of agriculturalists have always been really interested in the uh, the yield per acre of vegetable farming systems in China. You think of the book like Farmers of 40 Centuries that was published over 100 years ago. Um, but because pigs were so central to the, the vegetable production, um, this report actually has an entire appendix on pigs, talks about pigs extensively in the chapter on compost. Um, and actually provides some of the best data I found on how these pigs would have been traditionally raised. So from the, the History of Pigs article, um, it's actually a really cool rundown of all of the advice and, and guides that they had found about how pigs were traditionally raised. So one published in the 6th century, um, talks is about allowing the pigs to forage during the day, put them up at night, and then stockpiling some feed for the winter time. Um, 13th century uh, manual talks about how lakes and mountains are the best place to raise pigs. Um, interestingly, where the Meishans originate, the Taihu region is a, a lake region. Um, and then an 18th century manual talks about specific feeds available in the lakes of the forest um, and also explains that they should grow and collect their own feeds. And then by the 20th century, you have this um, really formalized system that was advocated by the government um, that's almost entirely based on source and produce feeds. And, and by that time, nearly all people were, were raising the pigs in kind of a close confinement sort of situation. Um, and you can really relate this to the population growth in China and the History of Pigs article does as well. As you can see, population really took off in the 20th century and this style of production was what really allowed that to happen. Um, so the main author of that, that article actually studies basically the effect of ecology um, as population grew in China. Um, and so as this population took off, it reduced the amount of grazing land for herbivores. Um, and that's why you don't see as much dairy and beef and stuff like that in traditional Chinese food. Um, with such population density, they needed domesticated animals that would thrive in a smaller space and could eat a wider variety of of foods, and that's why pork and poultry became more widely used. Um, now you do have draft animals, um, so there were horses and cattle used for, for draft animals, but traditionally not raised specifically for food. Um, so this comes from the Econ article, and it showed that through the 1990s, um, over 95% of rural agrarian households had pigs, and over 95% of them were raising less than 500 kilograms a year. It's probably not more than five or six pigs. Um, and pork was over 80% of the meat consumed by households in China, and 80 to 90% of that uh, was produced by the people raising no more than 500 kilograms a year. Um, now, this started diminishing a lot in the 1990s, but um, Meishans were imported in the late 80s, and that was what is really interesting to me about this breed. 
um, is that up until the point that they were imported, they were raised in a very traditional way. It's so rare that you come across a heritage breed that wasn't just kind of kept around for a long time, but was actually in real production in the traditional way up until its point of importation. Um, so most of the households were raising pigs, um, but not eating very much. Um, farmers both sold and ate the pigs that they raised. Typically, they would have been slaughtered for important celebrations, uh, you know, Chinese New Year, the, the spring festival, um, or weddings. They would eat some of the meat, uh, some of it would be cured, um, but otherwise fresh pork was not often eaten. Um, however, lard definitely was. Um, they would render and store the lard and that was eaten daily, um, cooked with the vegetables. Uh, fat has a lot of energy in it. So for agrarian societies, people who are doing a lot of work, those calories were really important. Um, so this quote comes from the uh, the History of Pigs article that uh, a farmer who doesn't raise pigs is like a scholar who doesn't read books. And the point that they make is that, well, this uh, type of pork production, it really helped um, facilitate the, the growth of population. Um, and they make the point that it meat was not the primary product. Um, so given how rarely they ate the pork, um, it wouldn't have been worth raising them had it not provided other substantial services. Um, and that is basically producing fertilizer to grow more food to feed more people. Um, so this quote uh, comes directly from the, the delegation. Um, and they provide some really, really good background to exactly how they fit into this, this fertilizing system. Um, so they report that in 1974, China produced 9.5 million metric tons of nitrogen from organic compost. Um, so to put that into context, uh, that would cover about 80% of the nitrogen demands that we currently have in the United States. Um, and they were doing that entirely from compost with pigs being the single largest contributor. Um, so this quote coming from the econ article, we keep cattle to plow our fields and pigs to fertilize our crops. They kind of made the same point. Um, however, this information here below, it does come from the, the delegation report as well. Um, it was pretty well standardized and, and highly advocated by the government. Um, the idea was that you would have basically enough pigs to produce enough fertilizer for the land that you were using. So that came out to about 15 pigs per acre or uh, one pig per moo, which is a measurement of, of 15, a 15th of an acre. Um, now, if you remember, most people not producing more than 500 kilograms of pork, um, you know, probably not raising all that many pigs. It shows you how much food that they were producing on a very small area. Um, that they were able to produce enough for their household and enough left over to sell on what was probably not much more than like a third of an acre. Um, so the measurement was basically a pig produces three tons of acre, you compost that correctly and you have enough fertilizer for that amount of space. Um, worth noting uh, in the delegation report, they show that around that time, pigs in the United States only produced about a ton a year of mostly wet manure. Um, that has a lot to do with the fiber that was fed to the pigs in, in this type of system and how that increases the amount of manure produced, um, which I will go into much more detail when I'm talking more about the physiology of the pigs. Uh, so this is an actual breakdown uh, from the report of what went into the compost. And if you look, you'll notice that um, 638 million metric tons of animal manure 353, more than half of that comes from just the pigs. And that's more manure than all of the, the human waste products that went into it as well. Um, that report about the, the nitrogen that they were producing, it's also really interesting. If you look at the, um, the potassium, uh, almost half of the potassium in their fertilizer came specifically from pig waste, um, which is really, really interesting to me. Um, so how they did this, um, a more traditional way and a more modern way. Um, raisin, kind of a confinement thing, fed on a lot of waste. Um, each commune kind of had their own way of, of feeding the pigs. Um, each one kind of had their own system in place. So you see this in the farmers of 40 centuries as well. Um, each farmer wasn't doing their own com compost. They have what the report calls like a brigade or a commune or village. 
um, like a group, they would, farmers would bring their stuff collectively, it would be composted and then it would be returned to the farmers. Um, but they would be feeding the pigs and then covering their manure each day. And then once a month they would clean it out. Um, or in more modern times, they would have been kept on concrete and just wash it straight into the tanks. Uh, in both situations, the um, visitors in the delegation said that there was no odors, no flies. Uh, you didn't even really notice the pigs. Um, and that number that I quoted about how much they were producing, by the 1970s, they're doing this with a lot of technology. So they have temperature controlled fermentation vats, you know, some heavy equipment involved in this. Um, but it's worth asking, what were they actually fed and how much of it was waste, how much of it were fine feeds? Um, so these numbers come from the, the econ article, uh, and it says that it's about a third in, in each way. So for the smaller farmers that were only producing 200 kilograms, it's 33% grain, 31 wheat and rice bran, 31 green feeds with only 2.4% of the feed they gave their pigs having to be purchased and then growing about 20% of the grain uh, that they fed the pigs and slaughtering it about 230 days. Now, if you go a step up to the slightly larger producers, um, a little bit more grain and a little bit more of the grain they produce and also buying a little bit more, but they're cutting off about 12 days of, of production. Um, now it does note that the larger producers uh, feed considerably more grain. They see significantly better results in, in growth rate, um, but those are the outliers. Um, as I said, the people producing up to 500 kilograms a day, that's 95% of producers through the 1980s. Um, and so I think these are the numbers we should be paying attention to is, is Maishan breeders because the larger, more commercial type are probably not using the traditional breeds. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, as I just said, um, this is 95% of the pork production going on at this time, which is up until the, the Meishans were imported, um, and the larger farms probably wouldn't have been using Meishans. Uh, so this is a kind of a feed report from the, the delegation. Um, this was their actual data from, you know, observing different farms in about four different regions. A lot of commonality, but some differences with the, the econ article. So they are raising out to eight to 10 months, I think 220 days puts you kind of in that neighborhood. Um, I couldn't get any slaughter weight data from the econ article. And this one also wasn't particularly clear about whether it's live weight or hang weight. I'm presuming this is a live weight, um, but also a lot of disparity in terms of what they were feeding where the econ article kind of says about a third of each. Um, this looks like it's overwhelmingly green feeds and a lot less fine feeds, but I also don't know if they're talking about in terms of nutrition or in terms of actual weight of feed. Green feeds often takes about five times as much green feed to equal one uh, pound of, of grain. So for example, if you're feeding alfalfa, fresh alfalfa, you need about five times the weight as you would um, a grain mix in order to get the same amount of protein and calories. Um, so this shows significantly less fine feed and significantly more grain feed, um, this, this report from the delegation. Uh, and then they also included kind of a guide that was given to farmers that suggested how they should be fed. And this was really illustrative to me because it was the only source that showed that they were stage feeding the pigs. Um, so as you can see here on the left, when they're really little, um, an 80 day period where you're giving a decent amount of fine feed, but not very much green feed and not very much corn coarse feed. Um, <clears throat> and as the pigs get older, you are increasing the fine feeds, but not nearly as much as you are increasing the uh, the green feeds. Um, they also in include, uh, you know, protein levels and uh, what they call feed units, which I think they're kind of just relating it to. It's the equivalent of this amount of grain. Um, so this is really fascinating to me to see that the farmers were very likely stage feeding, um, because that's something I do. That's something that um, farmers like John Arbuckle and people who rely a lot on alternative feeds do. You see this a lot in older books, um, whether you're talking about, you know, the old Morrison guides to feed and feeding. Um, pigs can handle a lot more fiber as they get older, but when they're younger, they need a lot more nutrient density. Um, and I think that's really, really good guidelines to, to raising pigs on alternative feeds. Uh, but nonetheless, it does really give us a good idea of the conditions under which these pigs were raised. 
um, and what they were selected to do. Um, now, I do want to conclude by saying that I don't necessarily think that's the best way to raise pigs. Um, so this is a picture from uh, an article in the, the London Times in, I think, like 1860s. Um, and it talks about the pigs that were brought in on a ship from China and that on the ship they were fed like cows and they look like pigs that were fed like cows. Um, you know, these were fairly poor sustenance farmers. This is a way that worked for them. Um, you know, we're talking a different time and place with different economic demands. Um, so I, I'm not presenting this information because I think this is the way that people should be raising pigs, um, but because it does show you, uh, you know, what this breed was adapted to do. Um, so please check out some of my other videos. Um, I'll have some videos on the unique physiology they've adapted because of these. Um, I'll have another video a little bit more specifically talking about the Maishans. Um, I found this really cool book. It's a full textbook all about the Maishan pigs. Um, it took some translating with Google Translate um, to, to kind of understand what's in it. Um, but I'll have that and some information from interviewing uh, Dr. Max Rothschild, who was the researcher that imported them and managed the herd at Iowa State for a long time. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, please do. You can get in touch with me through my website, oddbirdfarm.com. Um, or if you want to get in touch with the American Maishan Breeders Association, uh, maishanbreeders.com would be a good way. Or you can find all of us at the Make Mine Maishan Pigs uh, Facebook forum.